Well, good morning. Today we're going to have a journey about fire, of all things. Amazingly, if you think about fire today, I bet you a lot of you today really do have connections to fire, many times in a very difficult way, where you have maybe a home burned up or a neighbor or a relative that's had a terrible experience. Of course, some cases you can have just smoke inundating areas for weeks or months. You can't even go outside. You can't exercise. Schools get closed. Businesses close. Disrupts our society completely. And it's really, in some ways, that's what we hear about so much when we think about fire in the Western U.S. and in the United States altogether. But today I want to take us on a little bit of a journey, and maybe we'll look at that aspect and maybe some more. One of the first things we'll look at is a helicopter. In some ways, that short video might be the way that most of us in the room think about fire. Something's damaging, let's get the aircraft on it, let's get the firefighters on it, let's get it out. It's going to cause harm, and yes, they do. But that's almost our imprint completely, that fire is an enemy, fire is always after us, it's always going to just continue to haunt us. And this picture here is actually an incredible sign that I actually took a picture of a few years ago in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. It was after a large fire. And at any place in the country, or even North America, after a big fire, generally signs show up like this, thanking firefighters. Firefighting is a very dangerous business. I've done a little bit of it. It's very dangerous, it's very physical, it's hard. And yes, it's important because we have so many people living in different places. We have infrastructure, ecosystems, everything. So I, I tip my hats to firefighters. But there actually is another way we can think about fire. This is Val Lopez. He's the chairman of the Amamutsen Tribal Band. The Amamutsen home range is just south of the Bay Area. It includes Santa Cruz, halfway down to Monterey Bay, and inland about 50 miles. So that's the tribe that actually lived there for millennia. And Val is their leader. I've been able to talk to Val for a few times, and one thing he tells me about fire is absolutely fascinating. Val says the Amamutsen look at fire by Fire was given to them by the Creator for the stewardship of the land. It was a gift from the Creator for the stewardship of the Amamutsan land. Integral to their culture, used for millennia, and something that was incredibly important. And you think about us, it's completely different, isn't it? A gift from Creator for stewardship? Good grief. We think of it as, as a menace. What do the people like the um, Amamutsan do? Here's a cultural burning fire, but we have a cultural prescribed fire. Amamutsen are doing things like burning for food, acorns, grass seed. They're burning for medicine plants. They're burning to get quarters materials to make baskets. They're also burning for spiritual reasons. Another reason they burn is actually to keep their community safe as possible, because they had wildfires too, just like we did. But it was an integral part of their culture, and it continues today. This picture is actually in Santa Cruz County where they're actually doing some restoration burning with the Amamuts and Land Trust. So incredibly, they're doing some burning, getting back to their ways of managing land. Now, if you think about fire in California, here's a picture of Yosemite Valley, 1866, off of Glacier Point. Glacier Point's a beautiful place. We estimated a few years ago that on average, every year, California burned 4.5 million acres. 4.5 million acres. Over half of that was tribal burning. Over 50% of that was tribes all over the state burning for a reason. This picture right here, 1866, is really close to when the southern Miwok actually left Yosemite Valley, and they were burning right up to that point. There are some rec records of 1855, 1860, where Native people were burning this valley. Why were they burning it? Same reason we talked about oaks and other things, trying to get resources. Here, we see a picture that has an incredible vista, very low-density forest on the valley floor. And there was records, actually, when you stood at the Merced River, right on the river in Yosemite Valley, you look to the left or you look to the right, you could see all the way over to the cliffs. It was that open. Well, here's a picture down low. About the same time, you can see upper in Yosemite Falls. And right there is some beautiful black oak. Black oak turned out to be one of the most important food plants for the native people in Yosemite Valley. Here's a picture about 100 years later from the same vantage point. 
maybe you notice that, man, <laughs> we got trees. Trees everywhere, frankly. And what's happened is fire has been taken out because of fire suppression, the way we actually manage land, and then the trees actually are able to, to grow, and instead of fire killing a few of those and thinning those trees, the trees are persisting and growing. We know today that now the number of meadows, the meadow area in Yosemite Valley is less than 50% at what it was in the 1850s because of tree encroachment. Here's a picture I tried to take similar to that one I showed you a moment ago from the 1870s. Can't see Upper Yosemite and Lower Yosemite Falls here because we just had such a transformation in that ecosystem that we've actually seen trees increase in number. And not to say I love trees. I love them big time. But when you think about how we've transformed California, you know, California is known as the Golden State. I call it the Pyro State. And I don't mean that as a joke because fire used to be integral to the ecosystems of this place for millennia. Burning grasslands, oak woodlands, forests, wetlands, native people, lightning, it touched everything. And it still touches us today, but a very different way. Let's take a look now at a way that we've changed forest. Here you see a logging truck, big logs on it. And we've done some harvesting here, of course, we harvest. We need to harvest trees, in my opinion, because we build houses out of wood. Afterwards here, we see the forest is open. Now we start taking the big trees out, the little ones grow. Keep taking the big ones out, the little ones grow because fire suppression. Look how that thing is densifying. The forest is changing right there. And at the end of the day, there's Yosemite Valley. Not to say Yosemite was cut like that, it was cut a little bit, not that, that level, but this is essentially what's happened all over California. We've had multiple harvests, generally we target the larger trees because they're basically you know, more valuable, and then as we take fire out, we don't have the ability then to thin the forest, and lo and behold, at the end of the day, we have forest densities of two to three times what they were pre-1800. Here, when we add fire to it, in some cases, we get a system like this. This is the King Fire that burned in the El Dorado National Forest 2015. Started down by US Highway 50, burned up the canyon, and then we see here a picture of what it did to this forest. And the challenge about this is I'm not really too worried about the area burned because we used to burn so much in California. We actually have a fire deficit in forest in California. The problem that we have here in this photograph is there's too many trees dead. You can walk for miles right there and you can't come across a live tree. There's patches of dead trees in the King Fire in excess of 15,000 acres. And when you have that, what happens is, is the trees in the Sierra Nevada, when the cones actually mature, they mature and then they open. The seed is dispersed through the wind down to the soil and then it can grow a new tree. If you burn a forest at that intensity over large scales, you basically exterminate the seed source of the forest. The forest has no capacity to hold its seed and actually keep it alive through an event like that. If we go to Yellowstone National Park, completely different. Closed cones, lodgepole pine, it burns, cone stays closed, opens up, afterwards dump seed, get yourself a new forest. But in California, we don't have that type of forest ecosystem. Let's look at a couple more. Here's the Rim Fire. The Rim Fire is the largest fire in the Sierra Nevada, burned into Yosemite National Park, also in the Stanislaus um, National Forest. A very large fire, over 250,000 acres. Interestingly, the first agency that was asking questions about the Rim Fire was San Francisco Water and Power because of Hetch Hetchy Reservoir and the water that they were actually providing. It was a water agency that actually was the most worried, at least early in this fire, because of potential changes to watersheds. Here's the Chips Fire, another fire. This is the Feather River Canyon. One thing about the Chips that's interesting, it actually reburned an area and that was a 2,000-story fire in 2000. So we got two high severity fires on top of each other in 12 years. And you're seeing again mortality levels that are excessive to try to conserve forest ecosystems. A challenge for all of us. Here's the Antelope Fire that's in the eastern Sierra Nevada. This one's a little older, 2007. And you can maybe see in this photograph standing snags. And snags are actually important because they're wildlife habitat and we need those too, but we don't need them over huge areas continuous. That makes it very difficult for these forests to regenerate. This place actually has a lot of shrubs growing in the understory because the shrub seed bank in the soil is actually protected. And when a fire burns like that, the seed from the shrub can grow and you can have another ecosystem. This particular watershed, Antelope Lake, is 56% burned since 2001. It's also a reservoir in the State Water Project, California. Starfire, a little bit later, 2001. 
Another large fire you can see, big areas that died. A few places you see in the foreground, the trees survived. But still, trying to conserve a forest ecosystem there is difficult because of this, the vastness of the mortality. Let's take a look now at maybe what happened before. Here's a simulation of fires from both lightning and native people. You see to the right, you see a calendar years clicking along. The lower elevation forest is burning more. The moist forest, a little less, a little higher mortality, you see. The low continues to burn. The big trees basically just cruising along. Burns again, still going. There's the high elevation. So we had this very patchy fire regime, this incredible ability for fire to work land. And this went on for millennia. This is the way we think that our forest operated. Amazingly, the reason this is a forested landscape is because fire continues to burn. That's how you keep a forest in California. You either continue to burn, or maybe you do mechanical restoration thinning, and you work with that land to reduce the density, reduce all those issues. Now, how about a place where we can see this? Luckily, in California, Yosemite National Park began to actually do managed lightning fire 1972. What they did is said, okay, we're going to actually get fire back. We're going to start to get fire back in. We know that it was a part of ecosystem, so when lightning fires burn, we're going to allow them to burn, carefully monitor them, and check them out. This is a picture inside the Illouette Creek Basin. Illouette Creek is just to the south of Half Dome. So if you go to Half Dome, just to the south, you can walk in there, backpack, really cool spot. This particular spot right here burned three times since 1972. And you can see Jeffrey Pine, beautiful trees. It's a gorgeous site. The next picture I'll show you a little different. This is a patch of high severity. This is a patch of trees that have been killed by a fire. It's about 10 acres. And inside there, you can see some different plants. It's actually a wetland. It went from a forested ecosystem to actually a, a wetland. And we've been looking at this area for a number of years. Since 1972, the forested area in this area has been reduced by 22%. The amount of shrubs increased by 35%. The amount of meadows, wet and dry, increased about 200%. We've been watching the water come out of these ecosystems and trying to understand the water dynamics. This place has actually increased water slightly over the last 50 years. Other areas have had no fire around it have all decreased water output in the last 50 years. So we got a water connection, fire, and ecosystem. We also know this place actually has far less forest mortality when the drought happened here recently. Had a huge number of drought killed trees in many parts of the Sierra Nevada. This place had less than 10% of the average mortality that happened elsewhere. One thing about this place I'll say though is interesting is I've taken a lot of people in here and some people go in there and say, hey, man, that is a gorgeous place, man, that is awesome. That's what I say. But some folks come in here and say, man, that's a little messy. Too many dead trees, too many standing dead snags, too many logs on the ground, and they don't like it at all. But I have to say, this is the forest ecosystem that we hope to conserve into the future. There's no way we're going to keep fire out of our systems for long, long periods of time, just because it's just not a part of the ecosystem that you can remove. So Illouette Creek Basin kind of continues to show us. What can we do? Prescribe fire. Here's a picture of a prescribed fire we're doing in the northern Sierra Nevada. Prescribed fire is people putting fire on the ground for an objective. Here we're actually burning to reduce fuel loads, also to actually increase understory plant diversity. A drip torch is in there where we have fuel being dripped onto the ground and we're burning. We're using the weather. The weather is our ally. We're taking high humidity, low temperatures, and we're then burning these areas and getting fire back. A little like what the Amamutsan did. We're doing it here a little bit larger scale. The Amamutsan talk about burning a much smaller scale. Here's a place that actually prescribed fire we did with a little higher flame length. So we got to kill some trees. We think that actually the number of trees that were killed under the historic fire regime in mixed conifer forest in the Sierra Nevada between 5 and 10 percent. So we do actually got to get some fire in there to actually do that work for us ecologically. We need those early cereal stages. We need the shrubs, the grasses, the openings. And we can do that also in a place like this. So I'll end my talk here. I'll always say that firefighters, I will give them a thumbs up. A lot of my friends are firefighters and they're awesome. But someday I hope that we're actually gonna be able to give a thumbs up to fire lighters and they will be able to transform our ecosystems both with fire and also restoration thinning and we can move forward and actually enjoy our ecosystems. Thank you very much.